Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us together today. Uh, we, we, we come together with so many glad, um, uh, glad hearts, and, and, and our hearts are shaped in, in gladness in so many different ways. And primarily, Lord, we want to give you thanks for your ascension and what that means for us, uh, Jesus, to take your place at the Father's right hand. Bless us, be with us now as your word speaks and as your spirit leads. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. So you know that when, when uh, we're in the word, God revealed uh, his timeless word to us in, in several languages, Greek and Hebrew, a little Aramaic in there in, in the scriptures too. And then we translate uh, that Greek, that Hebrew, that Aramaic into English. And you know that sometimes I like to share with you what the Greek or Hebrew originally, what that original word was and, and, and how we often hear it in English, but there's a deeper meaning sometimes behind it. I've got a new word for you today, all right? Here it is. Say it with me. Whitmouth. Whitmouth. Come on, say it with me. Whitmouth. It's not Greek. It's not Hebrew. It's Tim. Yeah, and we're going to unpack what Whitmouth is for us as we celebrate the ascension of our Lord. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 and the ascension of Jesus. I'll let you get settled there. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. So the car was running in the driveway. And the car was packed, the keys were in hand, and parents were gathered around their child as she was getting ready to head off to college. The mother had made sure goodies were packed for the young lady. Dad had checked the oil, the tires were full of the right air pressure, and, and she was off to start a new adventure. This is what we parent for, Right? so that our kids would go off and develop and mature as adults. And the young lady pulled out of the driveway to start her new adventure, and, and there I stood with a tear trickling down my cheek. Anna was off to college. I wanted her to go, leave home, do what she was excited to do about, uh, do in life, but, but I was also torn and, and sad. Uh, to bring this all full circle, uh, She's going to be pinned on Wednesday as she's finished her year of college to be a massage therapist. And we're getting excited about it. We've come full circle with that. Jesus, who left the Father's right hand and descended in his incarnation, God taking flesh, and lived among us for 33 years, now is coming full circle. Jesus, go back home where you reign and rule on high at the Father's right hand and be blessed there for our sake. But, but boy, we stand on Thursday celebrating your ascension. and Maybe we thought about it. Maybe we didn't. I think the disciples, when they were celebrating that ascension, maybe, maybe a little tear rolled down their cheek too when they saw Jesus ascend on high. I stood there for a moment. I watched Anna's car drive off. And there was family in the house that I needed to go and attend to. I had a wife that I needed to care for as well as she was grieving. Sad, but glad. And I thought to myself, it's when it dawned on me, who is this moment for? I could make this moment all about myself. I'm sad. Uh, you know, I want to chase after Anna and say, don't go, come back. But it's not about, this moment's not about me. Moms and dads of kindergartners, the moment isn't about us. It dawned on me that, that this moment was about Anna and what God was having her do to spread her wings and go out in life. I wonder if the disciples thought about that when they were leaving that mountain. This moment of Jesus' ascension, who is this moment for? Me or for the Lord? I wonder if they thought about Whitmouth. Whitmouth. Who is this moment for? Jesus would say this moment was about him, right? In verse 44, Jesus says to us, 
everything must be fulfilled that is written about me. God can claim this moment that everything you've heard up to this point in time is now being fulfilled as I ascend on high. Who's this moment for? The one who reigns, our living God. But Jesus wouldn't just keep this moment for himself, would he? God's like that. God shares his moments of his incarnation, of his divinity, of his majesty and glory with us. Look around you in the beauty of creation today, right? Why are we gathered here together as God's people but to share in this moment of worship for him? And so he says to the disciples, guys, this moment's for you. He opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. I don't want you to stay ignorant in what this moment is about. I want you to understand it and grow in the maturity as disciples, followers of of mine. In this truth that I revealed to you, that you might carry this truth in you to the world. But Jesus, God, wasn't only thinking about that moment for himself or for the disciples. He was also thinking about us. Now, today, in verses 50 and 51, we're told that Jesus left his blessing upon these disciples and was taken up into heaven where, as the Spirit builds on in Ephesians chapter 1, the Father seated Jesus at his right hand in the heavenly realms. And it was there that the Father appointed him, Jesus, to be head over everything for the church, which is his body. It's the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. That moment on that hill outside of Bethany, that moment of Jesus' ascension was for Jesus, his disciples, and for us. Here today, some 2,000 years later, that we would know and be the fullness of him who sits at the Father's right hand. The difference for us between God, who has the right and the authority to claim every moment for himself, and you and, and me, the difference between us, God and humanity. And that so often, I want to make the moments of life about me. I want to make him about me. What I want. What I want to do. What I think I need where I want to go, and and what I really want to say to that driver who cut me off, right? Now let's think about how we might define a moment. Sometimes a moment is as quick as that. It's it's, it's very quickly. It goes by very quickly. Sometimes a moment's a little longer. Maybe it's a a conversation. Um, Sometimes we might even define, especially in God's economy as he judges time, uh, a moment we might even say is our whole lifetime as God measures time. So when we ask the question, who is this moment for? It's not just a lightning quick moment or a conversation. Maybe we might ask ourselves, who's this moment for? Who's this life for? Especially now that we live as the fullness of the body of Christ as members of his body, the church. I went back inside after a moment, and I hugged my wife and tended to the needs of the family who was with us that day. And I kept reminiscing and thinking about, who is this moment for? It's not about me. It's about Anna. And it's about what else is going to transpire from this moment. I don't know what's going to happen in the following moments of life. God knows that. He is, he holds us in the palm of his hand as he blesses and guides us. But I know one thing. I know that I can prepare myself from this moment on to receive Anna when she comes back home two weeks from now. <laughs> it was only two weeks that she was going to be gone. She was going to come home again. But when our Lord returns again, as he ascended on high, as he's promised to come back again, How is it then that we live in these moments, preparing for his return? Isn't that the question when we might ask ourselves, 
Who is this moment for? God would answer that for us very succinctly. He would want us to know as he works for us and on our behalf. Do you know who this moment is for? Jesus said, this moment is for you, my people. For the Christ will suffer. He's going to rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in my name to the ends of the earth. To people living in the moment of 2015 in Waynesboro, Virginia. For a moment, God had you. He had me, he had people at the center of all that he was doing. That moment was for a few hours on a cross in Calvary. That moment led disciples to a mountain in Bethany. And that moment has been going on as we measure time from now until the Lord returns. So friends, how do we live but celebrating with sins forgiven, lives claimed by God and his salvation as he would define the moments of our days by his grace and for his glory. Who is this moment for? Ultimately, we could say this moment is for our Father who reigns in heaven with his Son sitting at his right hand who has put all the enemies that I fret and worry and think about, even my own selfishness, under his feet. That I can know that every moment that I'm called to live is for him and for his glory. You know, some of those moments, some of these moments that we're given are very clear, like right now. This moment is very clear. We're here to worship the Lord, hear his word, and be nourished in that, that we might grow as his disciples. In fact, Jesus said that to his disciples as they were leaving the mountain, as they were wrestling with, who are these moments for? He said to his disciples, you, my friends, are witnesses of these things. These things that we've just talked about and discussed that you've seen, you're witnesses to them. It's very clear. Witness about them, then, to the world. And sometimes in the moments of life, it's very clear what this, who, this moment is for. It's for my neighbor, uh, for my family member. It's for somebody leaving home. Because these moments of life aren't lived for ourselves, are they? They're lived for our Heavenly Father in the lives of other people. Sometimes they're very clear. But other times they're not so clear. Sometimes it's hard to make sense of the moments of our lives. Jesus knew this too as he gave it to his disciples. He said, while you're witnesses of these things, in verse 49 he goes on and says, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Stay in the city. Well, how long, Lord? I'm not going to let you know that. Trust me. Stay in the city. And I'm going to clothe you with power from on high. Well, what's that, Lord? I'm not going to tell you. You have to wait and see what I'm going to send you. Sometimes the moments of life aren't so clear. Sometimes we're called to wait for his moving, for his hand, for his blessing. But even in those times when we wonder, who is this moment for right now, Lord? There's, there's still, still some direction as disciples, as people of faith, that we can exercise. The disciples, when they saw Jesus ascend, they worshipped him. They acknowledged that he is the Lord of this moment, of every moment of life. And worship has that connotation of subjecting oneself in submission to another to a deity, to one who is higher than ourselves, to an authority over us. And that's what they did. They subjected themselves in worship to their Lord ascended on high. Friends, when moments of life aren't so clear, worship the Lord. Subject yourself as a child of God, a disciple or a follower of Jesus, 
to him. Put yourself, as a child of faith, under his rule. He who ascended on high and worship him. And the disciples then left this mountain after they worshiped the Lord. The angels said to them, why are you standing here looking on, up into heaven? Jesus is going to come back the same way that he, 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 he left. And so they left that mountain and they went to Jerusalem like Jesus told them to do. Another aspect of our lives when we're not so clear about who these moments are for is in worshiping God, we also obey. We're called to obedience. And so we obey the Lord even when these moments aren't so clear. Why, Lord, do you want me to obey? I'm not going to tell you right now. It's not for you, to, for you to know right now, but simply to obey. They worshiped the Lord. They obeyed. And they went to the temple courts, and there they praised God. To praise God has as it, at, at its root one of these Hebrew words that I'll give to you today, hallel, <laughs> where we get the word hallelujah, where we get that expression, Jesus, he saves, praise the Lord, hallelujah, he is the one who saves. And they went to the temple courts, and in hallelujahs, they praised the Lord. In other words, this was their witness to the world. We know the one who saves us, who has given us this moment to live in now, and we will praise him. Sometimes these moments of life are very clear that the Lord gives to us to serve him, and sometimes they're not. And when they're not, we have an opportunity to worship and obey and praise him. Well, we have that opportunity to do that all the time, don't we? Even when the moments are very clear. So I give you this word. Witness. Who is this moment for? It's for the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as you give us the opportunity to worship, obey, to praise you, to sometimes, Lord, know exactly what this moment is for before us, and sometimes it's not so clear. Lord, give us that spiritual mindset those spiritual eyes, that longing and desire to know that what we're about, what the moment is for, it's for you. Give us this new word of our vocabulary and language, witness. As we ponder and think about, who is this moment for? Ah, it's for you, Jesus, our ascended living one. Be glorified then in all the moments of life. In Jesus' name and to your praise and glory, we pray and give thanks. Amen. May the peace of God, my friends, that, that passes all of our understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, and may you embrace that witness, <laughs> idea, thought, truth of who the Lord is every day in our lives. Amen. Kathy, you have a stewardship minute ready for us. We're going to share in the opportunity to continue to be discipled as um, uh, stewards managing life in, every day and we have the opportunity to so Kathy would you please share with us a stewardship minute it has been said that we are either givers or takers Verily, very likely however most of us fall somewhere between these two ends of the spectrum in John 12 we read about a very generous giver and an extreme taker. Mary, the sister of Martha and the brother of Lazarus, was a giver. Her giving was the anointing of her friend and savior. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. It reads in verse three. Mary's action demonstrated much love and devotion. She anointed Jesus with very expensive ointment or, perfu <coughs> or perfume. Very likely, this was the special ointment that she had been saving, and she found the perfect occasion to use it. How she anointed Jesus also showed her love and devotion. It wasn't enough that she used very expensive ointment. She used her hair to wipe Jesus' feet. Her acts of love epitomized giving. 
Mary gave herself and her best. In the same story, immediately following, we find a taker. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. It was clear that Judas was a taker and he suffered the consequences for his greed and selfishness. In our prayers, let's ask our Lord to send his Holy Spirit to grant us giving and generous hearts. May we, like Mary, be willing to give ourselves and our best. <laughs> 